When someone says they are a fan of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they could mean this version, this version, this version, or any of the various incarnations of this group of four turtles. The answer could also be all of them. The wide range of different TMNT series out there is pretty impressive with each of them having their own unique look, style, and ideas. And thanks to the newest version of the franchise that was recently in theaters, it started making me nostalgic towards the main Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles I watched while growing up, the 2003 version. There's something just so iconic to me from this being the first version of the Turtles that I was introduced to. It launched right as action cartoons were taking over across different networks, as it followed the mold to fit in with the other style of cartoons around it, and I believed it helped pave the way for the following TV series for the Turtles that came after, as those next shows have even more levels of stylized action that I would love to take a look at for future videos potentially. But with the 2003 version of the franchise, from the home video releases I remember so well, to the video games on both the Game Boy Advance and all the home consoles, but I mainly played one on the game. GameCube myself, this series is just iconic for me. So today, let's take a look at what the 2003 series for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles has to offer. Welcome back to the 25 Days of Fringemas, where there's going to be brand- Wait, 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 wait. Uh-uh. Ah. Double Fringemas. Aw, you only thought you were gonna get 25 videos this year? Look at you. You look silly. But I'm here to fix that because I'm going to give you not only 25 videos, but I'm giving you 50 videos. I have two channels. That's two Fringe Misses. Each day, there'll be a brand new video on both channels for 25 days. I haven't slept in months. Enjoy the content. Or don't. The base concept of the Turtles in the show is your standard setup with minimal deviations, staying closer to the original comics where Donatello, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael are trained by Master Splinter, their mutated rat father and mentor, as they have to fight off the evils that come their way, like the Foot Clan, led by the main foe for the Turtles, Shredder. The series itself at this point was the second animated series ever done for the property, as beforehand there was nearly a decade-long running cartoon that went through the late 80s to the mid-90s, and when this version of the cartoon came came out, the rise of action cartoons was happening across all channels that all had a heavy focus on cartoons. Whether they were more comedy focused or not, action was on top. Fox wanted to do something with the TMNT property that could be built out in the landscape of where franchises were heading, knowing that bringing the show to the early 2000s had to be more of a full rollout across all mediums to truly find success, at least in any studio's eyes. This not only meant a TV show, but there were video games, home video releases, toys, and merch, a standard that has always been around when dealing with properties like this, but in the early 2000s, it felt more prevalent than ever, especially when it came to the video game side of things as well. 4Kids Entertainment would be producing the series, as during this time, Fox held the rights to create the series, bringing the show to the Fox box, joining the already existing roster of Kirby right back at ya, fighting Foodons and Ultimate Muscle, to name a few. Being one of their earlier added-on shows before stuff like Sonic X, Shaman King, or even Cubix entered the mix. As for the show itself, the core idea was to give the Turtles a bit of a revamp after many years off from any new shows, allowing this new one to feel fresh, but one that pays tribute to where the series started with the comics themselves. You must be a serious Turtle action fan! A new episode of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles! This iteration of the Turtles was created to pay respects to the artistry and storytelling of the original comics in a way that the 87 series just kind of didn't. Co-creator Peter Laird set out to make a series that was as dark and intense, all things grimy and gritty, real and believable. And when he met show developer Lloyd Goldfine, who was on the same wavelength, things just seemed to click. From there, the series grew into a seven-season beast, developing a large space in the toy and gaming marketplace and handing off the baton once the time came for a fresher take on the Turtles. The show would become a Fox 4 Kids series, but it actually originally started with Warner Brothers. WB initially had the series in development, but Peter decided to back off and reevaluate the team he was working with. Because Peter was unhappy with the way the series development was going at WB, they worked on a sale between them and 4 Kids. The series we know and love today is thanks to Lloyd Goldfein, a producer and writer who had just started working for the company on Yu-Gi-Oh! Lloyd was hearing whispers that the IP was up for a renovation, so being a fan of the original comic and sharing Peter's pain over the first series, he thought he could do it justice, make the series true to Peter's vision. So Lloyd and a few other representatives drove out to Northampton, Massachusetts to meet with Peter and pitch their projects, and Lloyd's idea was chosen. From there, they began to construct exactly what this series would be. Four kids faced a lot of challenges in picking up such a huge project like TMNT. Before, they had experience in exclusively dubbing and re-editing shows like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! The company didn't really have the resources, or more importantly, 
importantly, the real estate needed for an animation project being developed, drawn, finalized from scratch. So they managed to squeeze this new department into their already existing office space in Midtown Manhattan, New York, putting Turtles right in their actual setting. In tackling the storylines, Lloyd would periodically travel up north to Peter's farm to stay for a week while they would break all the stories down. Once he was done, he would return to the city to meet with his team to start writing the episodes. Peter was more than just being involved in the series, he was the series. He apparently stuck to the mindset that none of this had to be done, and he didn't financially need to use the Turtles, so he could afford to say no, which is kind of a beautiful thing. He was also very involved in emails back and forth between the two of them, constantly providing valuable insight, like, that's not very Don-like, or Mikey wouldn't do that, etc. It takes around 21 weeks from pre-production to finishing post per episode, and sometimes one season can take as long as two years to complete, which resulted in them planning overlapping teams and seasons in production to release episodes faster. They also used post-production as another method of editing. Lloyd even says that there were scenes they added in that weren't even storyboarded. In defining the look of the series, they strive to return to the action-packed, dark and gritty style that the comics originally had. Peter mentions that the original series made the turtles look a bit like cutesy inflatables. He wanted them to be more muscular to look like they can kick butt as ninjas. He also noted that their eyes are so much more intense because they pull upon the classic comic book white eyes that give them a really scary and intense look whenever they need to be scary or intense. The location is also something that was handled beautifully. They treated New York City in the best, campiest way they possibly could. It was important to Peter that New York was both the home of the Turtles, but also was vast and shady, housing threats at literally every turn. He thought it was important that the Turtles were somewhat hidden, making the world they live in more serious. This also enters a really important dynamic in Splinter, having set rules for them as a father figure. We get to see him show concern as a parent, creating such a great depth to the character naturally. The art style was absolutely stunning, and it was so iconic at the time, with shows like some of the Batman series, Teen Titan, Gargoyles, setting the bar for grittier, darker animation. Early TMNT 2003 is pretty up there in my opinion. The way they use shadow work, split-screen animation, really detail-oriented color treatments, in the beginning of the series, it just felt that the Turtles were given so much love and attention. But this special treatment was cut short. After Season 4 is definitely when you start seeing changes due to both budget cuts and new management cracking down on kid-friendly content. Due to budget cuts, the team in New York started getting feedback from their animation partners overseas, asking them to please stop giving them these extremely complex and time-consuming shots. The split screen that displays two scenes simultaneously happening means that for the same runtime, two backgrounds, two scene plans, two different groups of characters animated in the front, it was just too much. Another thing that their overseas team told them to cut out was the color treatment. While it's a super subtle thing, you can notice changes in how the scenes are colored based on their environment. The colors are more muted when the turtles go underground. Another specific example was Bishop's lab that would have this really intense red lighting, and taking time to recolor everything as the red lights the different things on the screen, giving it a very lived-in and polished atmosphere. But it was simply too much to ask for. They had to transition into making the turtles one color, no matter the environment. Next in the Fox Box is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles! Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles premieres later this morning! After season 4 and the subsequent changes to what the animation team could demand, we saw highly criticized arcs like Fast Forward. Show director Roy Burdine says that he just decided to embrace the fact that the Turtles had to be unicolor and decided to go for a very traditional look, something very Scooby-Doo, the same color scheme no matter what. For the first half of the series, Roy doesn't remember receiving much feedback from the network, as for the most part, they got away with a lot more gruesome moments that today would raise an eyebrow for a network called Four Kids. Two specific examples here are when Leo beheads a Shredder robot, which is a more tame example here, and another when Baxter Stockman's organic clone meat suit literally decomposes. The last one was around the time that Roy says there was a lot of turnover in corporate, and the new people that took over seemed to be very concerned. That episode being pulled was a huge reason for the tonal shift in the later seasons, and this led to a weird arc break in season 5, and a whole chunk of lost episodes. Basically what happened is, you know how I mentioned earlier that they were would overlap seasons productions because sometimes it would take two years to complete a season. So season five was well into development, if not a good portion completed, or by the time the banned episode Insane in the Membranes effect hit. So all they could really do was scramble around episodes and try to throw in newer, brighter episodes, breaking up the arcs, if you will. This led to the scrapping of the Nightmares Recycled episode that never went further than storyboards. Regardless, I'm just pretty impressed that it managed to stay so unmicromanaged for the first three and some seasons. And 
and the fact that they were able to achieve such back-breakingly tedious animation styles just for the most subtle bump in viewing experience. I'm pleased with still receiving so many episodes that embrace that before it changed, even if it led to a less exciting and less coherent back half for the series run. Because of working with Peter and sharing his vision, I just love how well-defined each of the turtles are from one another. This is something that would continue beyond the series, but there it really helped separate them from feeling too similar with slight changes. I'm a huge fan of the darker tone the show carried at first. The comic version of the turtles is so cool it made me really like the turtles more than I ever did, so to have this series really try to find what defined the comics in the animation space was a true treat to watch. It felt like a show that didn't treat you, the viewer, as incapable of dealing with something that wasn't bright and vivid. It set out to have a true style, and for that, it really succeeded. This Double Fringe Miss is brought to you by Gamer Subs. Have you ever sat there and wondered, what it would be like if I just went to Gamer Subs and got 10% off by using code Fringe? Yeah. It's a nice thought, but guess what? It could be a reality if you just go to Gamersups, use code Fringe, get 10% off of whatever you're getting, and you feel good about yourself because you, you save 10% and you're supporting the channel. You wanna support me? What? Do you wanna support me? You wanna support? <laughs> Look, use code Fringe, 10% off. I appreciate it. Uh, bye bye. While I wouldn't say the back half of the series is bad, there's still a lot to like, it just loses a part of the identity that it worked so hard to establish in the first place, the thing that would make you fall in love with it. The success of the Turtles franchise knows no bounds. Sure enough, due to the lucrative nature of the series, they produced a ridiculous amount of games. Specifically, I remember playing the self-titled video game on the GameCube the most, as it was a whole lot of fun to play, and the series was followed by a movie called Turtles Forever that was technically budgeted not as a movie, instead, the creative team was told that they would treat it like three additional episodes that could be spliced together or separated to air as individual 22-minute episodes. Roy was really insistent on making them look different in the movie, however, and they took his suggestion, going for a two-tone, one-shadow treatment instead of the classic one-tone and one-shadow treatment for the original series. This carries a lot of weight in making it look like a polished movie, and it really does. After the movie, the Turtles were revived again for another animated TV series in 2012, this time through Nickelodeon. As as well as more beyond that, and they did just release a major motion picture revamping the turtles yet again, making them younger but having a lot of fun with the animation techniques and styles they used. Needless to say that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise is still alive and thriving. I really feel that the 2003 iteration of the show was so pivotal in changing up the formula, not being afraid to go in a darker, more true to the comics direction, and it led to no iteration of the show or even the movies feeling the same. This version is still so much fun to revisit, as there is so much good here and with the success of further series beyond it and everything that the series went through to be so special in its production, it's easy to see the 2003 TMNT as overshadowed and a bit underrated. But what about you? How do you view this series? Were you a fan of this iteration of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? And which version of the Turtles in general is your favorite? Let me know in the comments below. I've been Jordan Fringe. Thanks so much for watching. Like and subscribe. Later.